Good evening. As you can see on the screen there, we're going to be in the book of Luke. So go ahead and open up in your Bibles to that. We're going to be in Luke, the 11th chapter, and then we're going to jump over to Luke, the 18th chapter. I know normally in this class, we try to do one parable a week. We try to do one parable at a time. Uh, this one, we're going to actually try to do two, not only because both of them are relatively short, but also because they go so well together. Um, we've talked about a lot of different types of parables covering a lot of different types of topics. And this one almost exclusively covers the idea of prayer. And so I think it's best if we kind of jam them together and see kind of the similarities between them two. They address kind of different concepts within prayer, but they kind of go under the overall theme, the overall idea of the fact that we should be praying. And I think that's something that all of us know. A lot of us know that we should be praying, that we should make it a central part of our life. But I think some of us struggle sometimes with understanding the importance of it. Uh, we feel sometimes that we're talking to ourselves. We feel like God isn't listening. We feel like we can't express ourselves. We feel like we don't know what to pray for. Maybe we feel like we're saying the same thing over and over again. So all those concerns kind of feed into this overall fear and this overall desire that we have to actually not pray. And these two parables address that idea. They both address the idea that we need to pray, to never lose heart. And I think Jesus does a fantastic job of leveling with us and understanding that where our concerns are sometimes in prayer are not in the fact that we need, uh, that we sometimes don't know how to pray, but the fact that we just need to be praying in general. Um, so I think that's what he's really getting at with both these parables. That's why I wanted to take them together. Um, like I said, they address very similar concepts. As I mentioned, though, we're going to be in Luke the 11th chapter verses 5 through 8, and then we're going to jump over to Luke, the 18th chapter, and go through verses 1 through 8. We're going to look at the context of both of those, um, and I know that since we uh, are taking the context and discussing two different parables, the tendency will be to go long. We'll try to keep this within our normal 30, 35 minute little parameter that we've been established here in our class. Hopefully this series has been good for you. I've really enjoyed discussing the parables. We only have a few more weeks left. We have, I think, three more parables left uh, to discuss in September, and then we'll move on to something else. Um, like, a, as I mentioned, in the past. As of the time of this recording, we're still in quarantine doing these classes live streamed. Um, once we transition to in-person Wednesday night classes, whenever that time is, these will still be live streamed for you. So you can feel free to follow along with our future studies as well. Let's look at Luke, the 11th chapter though. And then Luke, the 18th chapter, I want to ask you before we move any further, what are these parables really about? You know, we've talked about these parables, and, th and this is the way that I like to kind of discuss each one of these parables before we get into it, because all of us have our own preconceived ideas of what parables discuss. And hopefully throughout this quarter, we've seen that sometimes our initial assumptions about Jesus' parables really don't pan out when you look at the context, when you look at what he's addressing, when you look at um, the historical context of where he's at, his audience. Sometimes our initial assumptions about what Jesus is addressing really doesn't pan out. So ask yourself real quick, what are these parables about? And I... You know, we ask this question every week, but I think this one, we probably have a very strong assumption about it. And some of this comes from a place of honesty. Sometimes it comes from a place of, you know, very, the fact that it seems very obvious what Jesus is addressing. But I think some of us think that the what Jesus is addressing in both these parables is that we just need to bug God to death. And the commonality between both uh, both the, the person who comes at midnight and the persistent widow, which is actually in the name, is persistence. It's the fact that we just need to keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. And there's a couple of reasons why that doesn't really pan out. Number one, it has the idea of vain repetitions, which is what Jesus directly advised against in the in the Sermon on the Mount when he discussed um, kind of the model prayer, which also is found here in Luke, the 11th chapter. Jesus, God doesn't want vain repetitions. He doesn't want us, you know, kind of just saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. But I think also the bigger issue is that when we have this idea that we just need to keep persisting in our prayers and saying the same thing over and over again and bugging God to death, it insinuates that God doesn't want to answer our prayers. And that's an extremely dangerous proposition and assumption for us to have, primarily because of passages like Romans, the eighth chapter and verse 32, you can pin this in to both Luke 11, verse five and Luke 18, verse one, if you want to. But Romans eight and verse 32 very simply says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Now, the direct context of Romans eight is about you know, keeping or remembering that your salvation is secure under intense persecution. I think that has an application to both these par both these parables, especially with the 18th chapter. But never mind, it's the same concept. It's the idea that if God gave us his son, and he freely gave us his son, we didn't ask him to do that. If he allowed his son to be sacrificed on the cross for our sins, why would he then withhold something from us? That's a rhetorical question, but it's a very easy to understand answer. But sometimes when we when we go to God in prayer and we ask him for various things, and then we sometimes don't see those things play out in our lives. Like we ask for something, we ask for help, we ask for deliverance, and then we don't feel like it's ever showed up. We believe for some reason that God doesn't really care 
about our concerns or about our worries. And that's the idea that God is trying to squash with both of these parables. He wants us to remember to constantly keep vigilant in our prayers, not just because it keeps that line of communication between us and God open, but also strengthens us as Christians. That's a powerful incentive. That's a powerful motivator. And it's something that we need to keep in mind. So the idea that God, that we just, just need to nag God to death, that's not present in these parables at all. There are some people that say that what he's after is that we need to have a good formula. We need to remember exactly what words to put in front of the others. That's probably a bigger temptation with Luke, the 11th chapter, because the model prayer comes right before that. I don't think that's really in view either. There are some people that think that we need to keep parables or that we need to keep our prayer short and sweet. There's certainly something to that, but I would encourage you when you pray towards God, quality over quantity. That's not to say that long prayers are bad and short prayers are good. What it means is that sometimes we think that if we can just keep banging on that door longer and longer and longer, that God will sometimes hear us. We need to, we need to for, forget that notion entirely. We need to eliminate that idea. We need to say what we need to say to God. We need to speak from our heart. We need to speak sincerely. And don't think that we can make up for a shallowness of heart with just an affluence of words, that we just have so many words, an abundance of words, that it kind of overshadows what's really inside of our heart quality over quantity in regards to our prayers. Both of these prayers, and we'll discuss this in a couple more weeks when we, when we look at the difference between the Pharisee and the publican, both of these prayers, or the model prayer is really, really short. The request by both the judge and by the, the friend at midnight, both of them are really, really short. They get their point across, it's heartfelt, and it's, and it's simple. That's what we need to keep in mind, that we're not impressing God with our command of the English language. All we're really doing is stroking our own ego when we, try to, when we try to do something like that. So ask yourself, what are these parables about? What's, what's these parables about before we really jump into it? I think when, when I look at this parable, it's about the value of prayer in general and about the value of secret prayer. I didn't come up with this quote. Somebody said this and I thought it was fantastic. They said, the secret of all failure is our failure in secret prayer. Think about that for a second. The secret of all failure is our failure in secret prayer. It's, it's easy to pray towards God at dinner time and when we're in public, but it's hard sometimes to go to God when we're in private because it's literally just us and them, us and him. We're just kind of exposing our own vulnerabilities. We're kind of exposing our own hearts and we're not really comfortable with that if we're being honest. And I think also because we don't really feel like it does much good, we think, well, if we're going to solve our own problems, especially as Texans, we need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We need to go out and solve our own problems. Well, sometimes we need to remember that God has the greatest control over everything, including our own lives. And we need to go to God in prayer when we can be found by just him, when we can be found by just us to expressing ourselves, expressing myself towards God, and then studying so I can I can learn and draw close towards him. That's what we really need to be doing is establishing a secret, private, intimate relationship with God that's outside of all these external forces. So I want to look at Luke the 11th chapter first. That's where we're going to be at. Luke the 11th chapter and verse 1. Uh, we're going to look at this parable. We're going to back up and look at this context here in just a second. But as you see here in Luke the 11th chapter and verse 1, the, the point of this parable is very simple. The, the parable and the model prayer both come after a request by his apostles when they say, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Somebody had made uh, some kind of a good point about this that I think is, is worth pointing out. They said that he doesn't really say, teach us how to pray. He just says, teach us to pray. And that may be splitting hairs. That may be kind of diving too deep into the text. But notice that he asks them, we just need to learn to pray. We need to learn to just get on our knees and actually do that. What this, what this teaches us is that both the idea of prayer and also the desire to pray, both these sometimes need to be taught. You know, it's not necessarily instinctual. We think sometimes that when we, when we, when we find a need great enough or when we, our heart is right, whenever the time is right, that's when we'll kind of establish a time of prayer. That's not necessarily the case. You know, you look at, at somebody like Daniel who established a daily habit of praying every single day ultimately led him to the lion's den, that didn't happen because he just felt like it. It's not because he was some kind of super disciple, some kind of super you know, person that decided that he was going to be really, really close to God and nobody else could ever do that. He decided one day that he was going to do that. And so while we look at this in Luke the 11th chapter and think, I can't believe how infantile these people are. They need to be taught to pray or taught how to pray. I would commend them because it shows that there's a desire to draw closer to God. And it shows us what we need to be doing as well, that we need to develop that desire to draw closer to him, to commune with him. 
I want you to keep your finger, though, in Luke the 11th chapter. Back up just a little bit. Look at, look at Luke the 10th chapter, starting in verse 38, leading into um, this passage. Luke the 10th chapter, in verse 38. As they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. This parable seems to not really fit with what he's going to be talking about here in Luke the 11th chapter, but this section, not, not this parable, but this section Luke in here in Luke 10, 38 through 42, this section is almost entirely about keeping your priorities straight. Martha should not have been in the kitchen doing dishes when Jesus is out there teaching. You can't confuse, you know, physical responsibilities with spiritual responsibilities. So it's all about our priorities. And verse 42 signals that when he says, Mary has chosen the good part, which is not going to be taken away from her. There's always going to be dishes. The lawn is always going to need to be mowed. There's always going to need to be housework done. There's always going to be these types of things. But Mary has chosen the most important part. Focus on that. When you go from that section into Luke, the 11th chapter, I think it makes sense why, at least contextually, the disciples walk up to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples, which, by the way, says something about John's work, that it wasn't just about repentance and preaching and about drawing people to himself and baptizing them. He taught them how to have a relationship with God that was based around obedience, that was based around repentance, cleanliness and purity, and also about prayer. That was the focus of John's relationship with God, and that's what he taught his people to do. But look in Luke the 11th chapter. Verses two through four, very similar to um, very similar to the one that you find in Matthew the sixth chapter, the model prayer. There's some differences though. It's not the same prayer, which signals to you that it's or signals to us that it's not necessarily you know a formula that we need to follow, but it's about what he's teaching. It's about how what kind of components are important when we go to God in prayer. When he says here in verse two. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. The components are all there. The components of magnifying God's name, the components of re remembering that we need to forgive others, the, the component of remembering that we need just our daily bread. All of those things are important. So here in Luke the 11, chapter verses 2 through 4, we have a really brief prayer that hits the highlights, that puts the most important things into the prayer that we need to be praying on basically a daily basis. So that's the thing that I want us to focus on as we move into the parable. The parable here in Luke the 11th chapter, starting in verse 5, it kind of builds off that idea. Remember the priorities in your life. Remember the priorities in prayer. But then here, look at Luke the 11th chapter. In verse 5, he says, Suppose each one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, Don't bother me. The door has already been shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. This parable is very simple. And I love how Jesus uses parables that are so down to earth it's easy for us to kind of associate with that because all of us have been in the position where we've been living our life and you know doing our own thing. And then somebody whom we love, a friend or a family member shows up and needs something from us. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we kind of feel the same inconvenience that he has in this moment where he says, look, I'm, my kids are in bed. You know, I've already put the food away in the refrigerator. I'm already asleep. I'm in my jammies. I don't need, and yes, I did just use the word jammies. I don't need to get up. I can't get up and give you anything because it's going to disrupt my whole routine. So all of us feel the inconvenience in this moment. And yet you, you see here in verse 8, the teaching of this parable, the fact that even though he's not going to give up in anything because he's a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. He just wants his friend to go. And that's where people, that's where people think you know, that our desire and prayer, our, our goal in prayer is just to bug God to death. If we can just annoy God to death, then he'll just give us whatever we need to just go away. And once again, that reiterates the assumption that God is reluctant to answer our prayers. He's not. What he's doing in both this parable in Luke the 11th chapter and in chapter 18, and this is the fundamental point to remember about both of these, what he's doing in both of these parables is reiterating the fact that if, if this guy's 
you know, request is going to be answered because of his persistence. He doesn't even want to get up and give it to him. How much more will God, who actually wants to give you things, how much more will God bless you spiritually? And just because we don't see the fruits of those prayers in everyday life doesn't mean that God doesn't care. So we need to remember that God always has our best interests at heart. That's at least, I think, fundamentally what he's addressing through both of these. And when you look at this parable, you know, kind of as a whole, you see what he's, you see the danger that he's dealing with here. The first century house, a Jewish house in this time period is much different than ours. You know, they've got to think about their livelihood. They've got to think about their, you know, their family that's all under kind of one roof. They've got to think about the space constraints, especially if they're living, you know, in, in or near a city or inside of a village. Property is everything. These people, they've got to be very space conscious. And so the way that a first century Jewish home was constructed was in usually in two levels. You had this top level, maybe off to the side a little bit where the family slept. And then on the bottom levels where you had the animals. And as with any, as with any, you know, farm or as any, with any space, people who own space knows, you don't want to disturb those animals at night. They're down, they're kind of, kind of do their own thing. You want to make sure that when, when they sleep, you sleep. You don't want to disrupt what's going on inside your household. You don't want to get up and make a noise that's going to wake your kids. You don't want to make a noise that's going to disrupt the animals. You want to keep the peace. And so the fact that this guy is banging on the door asking for something that he needs shows, number one, the urgency that that friend has. And that's something we never address when we talk about this parable is the urgency of that friend that comes at midnight. He has to have something. But also just how much of an inconvenience him being there at the door is causing his family. It's going to wake his entire family up. So that's why he says there in verse 8, he's not going to give him anything because he's friend. He's his friend. That that can wait till tomorrow. He's going to get up and give him something in that moment because of the disruption that he's causing to this guy's everyday life or to, to the disruption that he's causing to this guy's sleep and the sleep of his family. That's the dynamic that he's introducing here into this passage. And when you look at verse 9 down to verse 13, it's kind of, it kind of builds up this. He says here, kind of in response to this parable, verse nine, so I say to you, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks to receive and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. It, it seems so simple to us to think that all we need to do to receive something from God is just to ask for it. God, is, God always has our best interests at heart. And so if we ask for something that, that we don't need, that's gonna hurt us, He's going to give us something else that will be addressed here in verses 11 through 13. But the reality of the situation is we just need to ask. You know, James chastises his audience on two occasions in his book in regards to prayer. Number one is because you don't have because you don't ask. He who asks for wisdom from above receives it. You don't have because you don't ask for it. So don't be mad at God that you don't give it because you never asked for it. So we just need to kind of get that in our mindset. The second time he, he chastises them in the book of James is because you asked for it, but he's not giving it to you because you're going to spend it on your pleasures. You're going to use it to hurt other people, to feed your flesh. It's a very selfish type of reason. And so when we go to God in prayer, we need to remember first and foremost to ask, which by the way, goes directly into what he says there in Luke the 11th chapter and verse one, teach us to pray, not how to pray, but teach us to pray. But we need to remember also that the motivation for our prayer matters as well. So that's the, the kind of the teaching there in verses 9 and 10. 11 through 13, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He's not going to give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? If he's asked for an egg, he's not going to give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If, if we know how to give gifts to people, and we know how to discern between gifts that are going to help and gifts that are going to hurt. How much more does God know? I can't tell you how many times I've asked for a scorpion instead of for an egg. This is, you know, I, I think I want this. By the way, that's in verse 12. I'm not just <laughs> pulling those two examples out of, out of thin air. But how many times have we asked for something that we know in hindsight would have just hurt us? And God knew that ahead of time. God knew that what we were asking for was dangerous. And what he's going to give us is something that will actually help us. That's the teaching there in verses 11 through 13. We need to at least pray for those things. But we need to also pray and remember that God always has our best interest at heart. That's what you see here in verses 5 through 8. He's not going to give him anything because he's his friend. As I mentioned, that will come tomorrow. He's going to give him something that he needs in that moment because he's persistent. And if, if we as humans understand 
that, or if we as humans know how to discern between good gifts and evil gifts, if we as humans know how to give people things, you know, because of persistence, if we as human beings give things because of X, Y, and Z, how much more freely is God, who loves to give us these things, going to give them to us? We need to remember that, that God is always wanting to bless us spiritually and help us draw closer to him. But we have to ask for that. We have to ask with proper motives. We have to ask according to his will. We have to ask for these things. Remember to always pray. Now, Luke 18 builds on that principle. And that's an important thing to keep in mind is that Luke 11 focuses on the fact that we need to pray. Luke chapter 18 focuses on the fact that we need to keep praying. Look at Luke the 18th chapter. Luke chapter 18, starting verse 1. This is such an emotional parable. It's such a, it's such a heartfelt parable. Because Luke has this kind of preface on here in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, where he says, Now he was telling them at a parable to show that at all times they need to pray and not to lose heart. Raise your hand if you've not prayed because you've lost heart about God's promises. You've lost heart about God's prayers. You've lost heart about whether or not God's going to fulfill those prayers. All of us have. All of us have felt that way at various points in time. And so what he's saying here in Luke 18, chapter and verse 1 is, we need to pray at all times and not to lose heart. Once again, the context is very important because back it up to Luke the 17th chapter and verse 22, this will sound very similar to the parables that we've discussed from Matthew chapter 24 and 25. We're going to discuss another one at the end of this quarter in Matthew chapter 25. But in Luke chapter 17 verse 22, this discussion here down to the end of this chapter should seem very familiar because he's describing... In, in roundabout ways, the destruction of Jerusalem, but he's also going to describe in roundabout ways the coming of the Son of Man. He's going to describe the end of time. Both of those time periods, especially the coming of, of AD 70 with, um, with the, the destruction of Jerusalem, those things are going to be fraught with persecution. But when you zoom out a little bit further, even just the life of a Christian is going to be fraught with persecution. Luke chapter 17, starting verse 22, he talks about the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. You will wish that you could see it, and you can't see it. They will say to you, look there, look here. Don't go away. Don't run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But he first must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Persecution came to Jesus. Persecution is going to come to us. Jump down to verse 32. On that day, there was one who was on the housetop whose goods are in the house, must not go down to take them out. Likewise, the one who was in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Push forward, move on towards your goal, not backwards towards your physical possessions. Verse 33, whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you on that night, there'll be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There'll be two women grinding at the same place. One taken, the other left. Two men in the field, one taken, the other will be left. It's going to be spontaneous. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to be something that catches a lot of people off guard. But verse 37, they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to him, he said to them, wherever the body is, there the vultures will also be gathered. In other words, where there's a corpse, there's going to be birds. There's going to be vultures there. So wherever there's sin, that's where judgment is going to take place. So immediately the minds of these people, their eyes would have most likely been pointed towards Jerusalem because that was not only the hotbed of Jewish extremism, but it was also the place that in only a chapter or two would crucify Jesus. Jerusalem would be probably the place they would that would come to mind the most, and that would eventually, ultimately, 40 years later, be the place that was destroyed. So the thing to keep in mind about Luke 17, starting verse 22, leading into chapter 18, is that this parable comes on the heels of persecution. As a matter of fact, and not to jump too far ahead, but in Luke chapter 18, when it says that, um, when it says in verse 5 that this widow bothers me, that's a boxer's term for stun. It has the idea that you're hit so hard, you're just kind of, you you're, you can't see straight. So that's kind of the same idea that we're getting at here with this idea of persecution, that persecution is going to cause a lot of people to look towards God, as it should. But will we continue in faith towards God, even when things on the surface just look bad? You know, all of us, when we experience, you know, personal struggles, whether that's health-related, financially related, family-related, all of us, when we experience troubles, hopefully turn towards God initially. But the question is, when you've been undergoing chemo for you know, five months, six months, and the prognosis really hasn't changed or has even gotten worse, or you've been struggling with your finances and you don't know how you're going to work your way out of it, and you've struggled with it for years and years and years, or when you struggle with some kind of 
you know, some kind of mental issue. I've been very open about the fact that I struggle with anxiety and depression. If you've been dealing with that for years and years and years, the question is not, are you going to pray to God initially? The question always is, will you continue in faith towards God in prayer? Because if we, if we pray towards God for years and nothing changes, it'd be very easy for us to think that God doesn't care. God's not listening. We're just wasting our time. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 signals to us that we need to pray at all times and not lose heart. That's, a, that's pertinent to these people who are going to be undergoing persecution. It's pertinent to us who are going through our own struggles to try and draw closer and closer towards God. So keep that in mind as we look at this parable. Look at this starting in verse 1. It says, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray not to lose heart. In a certain city there was a judge who didn't fear God, um, I'm sorry, who didn't fear God, nor did res he did not respect man. There was in that widow, there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I don't fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. There's a couple things about this. Number one, on the surface, it seems like it's the exact same principle that's taught in Luke, the 11th chapter. All we need to do is just annoy God to death, and he will give us whatever we want. Just bug him. Just annoy him, and he will give us whatever we want. That's not what he's teaching here. Keep in mind these two verses, Luke 11 and 1 and chapter 18 and verse 1, to pinpoint what the real point of these two parables is. Number two, we need to remember that the judge that he's talking about here in this passage is probably not a Jewish judge, because as he mentions there in verse 2, he's outright about the fact that he doesn't fear God, he doesn't respect man. So the judge that he's referring to in this passage is probably not a Jewish judge. You also know that because in that day and age, Jews did not usually take their complaints towards a judge. They took them towards the elders. So if this would have been a, a fellow Jew that he's addressing here in this passage, he would have probably said in a certain city there was an elder who didn't fear God nor respect man. Both of those components together signal that he's probably talking about a woman who goes towards a Gentile, probably a Roman, and asks for protection from her opponent You know, in that moment. Those types of people would have been especially... Um, probably a religious as opposed or, you know relative towards the average Jew, but they were also notorious for being you know very very political they 'll do whatever they need to do to to stay out of trouble to stay in office that type of stuff so when he says here in verse two there was a judge who didn 't fear God nor respect man that 's probably exactly right. This is a guy who didn 't really have a strong moral compass he didn 't have any fixation towards a specific deity that he had with any kind of devotion. He didn't really care about the people that he was presiding over. This guy could not be a worse candidate for a judge if he tried. That's the point of verse 2. And yet he says here in verse 3, there's a widow who, of all the people in that city, probably needs the most kind of protection. And what he's probably, what he very well might have been addressing here in verse 3 is some kind of financial protection. You know, widow who has... A husband who has you know, obviously passed away, left her a large estate, is going to be attacked, especially in that day and age, by people who are trying to call back you know, bad debts, old debts, maybe people who are you know, trying to accuse her of something to try and get the money, or she may be somebody who is completely destitute, which was more often the case for widows. They were completely destitute, didn't have any opportunity to, um, didn't have any opportunity to make money really by themselves. What they had, they needed to protect. And so you have kind of both of these parts of this parable where there's a judge who doesn't have any kind of a moral compass and then you have a widow who needs somebody desperately to help her in her corner. He was unwilling. She kept coming to him over and over and over again. The only reason he gives her any kind of protection at all is because she just bugs him to death. Now listen to what he says in verse 6. The Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Will not God now bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the, uh, on the earth? That, that teaches the real, once again, the real point of this parable. The point of this parable is to address the fact that if this unrighteous judge is going to give protection to somebody who so desperately needs it, but who in reality will probably never be able to repay him politically, financially, for this protection, he's going to do it. And he's going to do it for these very selfish and very carnal reasons. If he's going to do it because of this, how much more will God want to protect somebody or want to help somebody when they cry out to him day and night? God who wants to bless us, God who wants to protect us, God who wants to take care of us, he's going to protect us even more. So fundamentally, the teaching is the same on both of these parables. The context is different. 
Remember to pray, pray and not lose heart. Start praying, persevering in prayer. Both of those are the, that kind of the ideas of these two parables, but the, the reality is the same. If God is going to help you, if God wants to help you, then we need to start praying. We also need to not lose heart in regards to our praying. That's what both of these parables teach. Luke chapter 18, though, and verse 8 to me, is probably the most powerful verse in both of these parables. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, he says at the end of this, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You can almost imagine Jesus saying that to his audience, and he kind of sits back and he thinks to himself, you know, this is, this is a question for you. Will he really find faith on the earth? Will he find what he's looking for on this earth? Will he find this level of faith? We talked about in our, our lesson on Sunday about, about the one who understands authority. You know, I say to this person, go, and he goes, you know, go and do that, and he does that. This person understands authority, and Jesus linked that to faith. He linked authority with faith. So faith comes in multiple different forms, but it's always linked up with action in some form or fashion. So when he says this here in verse 8, when same man comes, will he find faith in the earth? What kind of faith is he talking about? He's, talking about, he's not talking about faith that you know, we believe that God is out there. We're not talking about faith that God, you know, that God created the world. We're talking about a faith that is demonstrated through prayer. Will he find the faith in God where we go to him? We go to him for our needs, for the fact that we need to constantly have a relationship with God in prayer and through prayer. Will he find a faith that in the, in the darkest times of persecution, even when it seems like everything around us is falling apart, will he find the faith of somebody who continually looks for him? and looks towards him, will he find that type of faith? That faith can only be created by a heart that is earnest, earnestly desiring to seek after him. And that's the question that we have to have. Will he find faith on the earth? The question really is, will he find faith in me? Will he find that kind of faith where no matter what's happening, I'm going to continue to draw closer towards God in prayer. I'm going to continue to ask him for his blessings. I'm going to continue to seek after him. Will he find that type of faith and me. That's the question that we ask ourselves after both of these parables. Next week, what we're going to be discussing um, is very simple. We're going to be discussing the parable of the talents, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. This is probably one of the more well-known parables, probably should have been put towards the end or beginning of this class or this quarter. I, I didn't think about it, obviously, till you know, later when I was putting the schedule together. But we're going to be looking at the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. A lot of the context will be very similar to what we've discussed um, several weeks ago, but it's all with that idea of Jesus's last few, you know, weeks and days on earth, things that he really wants to point out. And this has a special application to the scene, the great throne room scene of judgment day that happens right after that Matthew chapter 25. So I encourage you to stick with us next week, follow us on our Facebook page, jump in, make comments, whatever you want to, and I'll come back and answer them. Uh, any questions you may have as well, but I encourage you to stick with us. I appreciate you spending your time this evening with me, and I will hope to see you digitally next week. Thank you.